Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Envisioneering Exchange, the podcast where industry leaders discuss the most important topics in building and urban efficiency. I'm your host, John Sheff, Dan Foss is Director of Public and Industry Affairs. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. Today's topic is indoor air quality in the post-pandemic world, and I am thrilled to be joined by my guest, Francis Dietz. Francis is the VP of Public Affairs at the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute, or AHRI, the HVAC manufacturer's main industry organization. Francis, thanks so much for joining us today, and please uh, tell us a bit about yourself and your role at AHRI. Well, thanks, John. Uh, It's really good to be here, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. In my role at AHRI, I oversee the team that handles our internal and external communications, our media relations, our websites in our meetings and events. Um, Actually, uh, one of your staff is on our public affairs committee, which sort of oversees all of our public affairs efforts at AHRI. I also do uh, speech and article writing and podcasts. It's actually a really fun job, but part of what makes it fun is being able to interact with our members. And we haven't been able to do that for quite some time now. So I'm really hoping, as I know everyone else is, that we're turning the corner on this pandemic and we can get back to meeting face-to-face because, I mean, if you're in public affairs, not being able to meet face-to-face is pretty difficult. Yeah, I know. I always say that um, a lot of the fun parts of our job were kind of taken out when this pandemic hit, but um, I'm hoping that we can get back to the halls of HRI maybe sometime this year. That would be great. We talk about indoor air quality. It's a very hot topic now in this world, but even before the pandemic, indoor air quality or IAQ, as it's commonly referred to, was becoming a pretty hot topic in HVAC and building sectors because it's being linked to productivity. Can you talk a little bit about that and explain that link a little bit more? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, we certainly weren't the first to discover the link between comfort and productivity. I mean, that probably happened millennia ago, but our members, of course, work on it and think about it constantly. I mean, being comfortable in your office with fresh air, with clean air is really vital. And what this pandemic did was bring that even further to the forefront. So I think one of the downsides to the trend over the past couple of decades, at least, of completely enclosing office space with no potential for open windows is that it wasn't replaced on a one-to-one basis with proper ventilation and filtration. So what you see today is a move to make sure that that occurs. And I think that's all to the good. I mean, there's not a lot probably good that came out of this pandemic, but I think going forward, that's certainly one of them. And yeah, you know, as we talk about what's going on now during the pandemic, indoor air quality and kind of a focus on that, like you mentioned, is really critical, getting people back into offices, back into schools, and really getting the economy back on track. What are some of the challenges we're facing and how is our industry responding? Well, I think one of the big challenges is that those who are suddenly tasked with putting in place new IAQ measures for schools and for commercial spaces don't have all the information they need to make informed decisions, you know, about what can be some some pretty costly and difficult measures. So that's why at AHRI, we put together two papers, Anatomy of a Healthy School and Anatomy of a Healthy Commercial Building, that both include five steps that building engineers and others can take to make their buildings as safe as possible. These include first, of course, making sure that the technicians doing the work are certified to do it properly. In this case, it's an organization that our industry founded called North American Technician Excellence, or NATE. NATE certified technicians are trained and tested in one of the more than 14 different HVAC areas. So making sure the technicians that you use are NATE certified just provides that extra you know, peace of mind that installed equipment will work as it's supposed to. And that's particularly key in this area, of course. And then we followed that up with four recommendations, complete with source links for building engineers to undertake. And that includes improved ventilation, uh, proper filtration, perhaps UV light treatment, and then excuse me, appropriate uh, humidification. And John, the, the filtration one in particular is where you wanna be sure you have a certified technician because as we talk about in the paper, not all systems are designed to handle huge increases in filter MERV ratings. In fact, Installing highly efficient filters without understanding the capacity of your air handler can be damaging to your system. So that's one of the, you know, the key areas that you want to make sure that 
the technician who is advising you on what to purchase and installing knows what they're doing. So Francis, you mentioned increasing filtration, increasing outdoor airflow and putting some ultraviolet lights in there. Let's back up a little bit and talk about what is important to making a space safe in this post-pandemic world. Well, for one thing, you want to make sure that you want to keep the airflow going because any particulates, any pathogens, if you will, uh, in this case, that are flying around, you want to keep them flying, right? You want to dilute them with as much air as possible so that they can have much less opportunity to do damage. And of course, with filtration, you want those to go through the filter before they ever get to occupants of a building. And, you know, in the case of UV light, I mean, some pathogens are always going to get through a filter. So in the case of UV light, you would get the rest of them when it came through. But the idea is sort of similar to what you get when you're outdoors. I mean, that's why they say, oh, it's okay to eat at a restaurant with people outdoors because the possibility of viral infection is much less when you have all that extra air to dilute it. And yeah, I remember back to the spring and when the pandemic first started, there was a lot of misinformation going around about the role of HVAC in spreading the virus indoors. But the opposite is actually true. So we've come to understand a little bit better. A well-functioning HVAC system can actually help mitigate the spread of the virus, right? I'm glad you brought that up because the misinformation that you're talking about was a non-peer-reviewed study that came out of China, I think, last April that got our attention in a big way on the issue uh, as an industry. And because even though it was not peer-reviewed and the researchers admitted that they didn't look at all aspects of the situation, our CDC nonetheless posted it on its website and media people picked it up and ran with it. And that got our attention because the study claimed that a single mini split air conditioning unit in a restaurant in China was responsible for several people getting COVID because the virus was allegedly spread through the air. And that led to uninformed and I would say hyperbolic suggestions in the media that air conditioning was somehow a danger to people during the pandemic. And that was dangerous, of course, to us as an industry, but much more dangerous to people, particularly those who were quarantining in their homes because they thought that having their air conditioner on was going to make them less safe. They were going to turn it off, which was going to make them even less safe. You see what I'm saying? So it was really a issue that we had to jump on. And we did. I mean, we, we worked with ASHRAE and Hardy and ACCA and, and others on this. And we launched a campaign. We initially uh, did a five steps to safer schools because at that point, School systems were deciding whether to go back in person. Obviously, they didn't do it. So now we seem to have a lot more time to implement this. But then we went to the five steps to healthy commercial buildings for the same reason. I mean, people are looking to maybe get back into the office. And we made all the information available on our website. And we advertised in school and uh, building-related publications to try and educate people about the issue. Um, and at the same time, you know, so we were talking to reporters and trying to set them straight as well. But you're correct. I mean, the opposite is actually true, that air conditioning with appropriate amounts of outside air coupled with proper filtration can go a long way toward mitigating any spread. And the idea really is the same, as I mentioned earlier, is eating outside versus inside during this time. And, you know, ventilation is really a, a major key for virus dispersal. Yeah. And I remember being in some of those meetings, looking at some of those webinars and some of the information campaigns that you were putting out there. And, and they were really strong in trying to dispel some of these myths. And it's just crazy how we've gone through this pandemic in all sorts of industries and public health campaigns have the major challenge here is really about education and misinformation and trying to bat some of that down and get people to believe what the proper mitigation techniques are. And, and our industry is no exception there. But for now, the topic is all about indoor air quality, public safety. But before that, our industry focused so much on efficiency and making our systems as efficient as possible, saving money. Are these two topics inversely related? I mean, when we're talking about increasing the outdoor airflow, increasing filtration, we are necessarily talking about decreasing the efficiency of these systems. Is that true or not? 
Um, probably in some cases it is, but what it really is not so much energy efficiency itself, but energy use itself. I mean, for increased ventilation and filtration to be effective, the fan has to run most of the time, which is not the way we do it today, typically. And like in a school building, I mean, it's only going to run when the students are there and then occasionally, perhaps during the night, and then practically none on the weekend. So now, you know, if you're running the fan much more than normal, it's going to increase your energy usage. Now, I mean, one way to mitigate that, of course, is to replace the existing heating and cooling equipment with higher efficiency units. I mean, if the timing is right, that is, if, if that equipment is already on the cusp of being replaced, then doing so now, especially if funding is available as it is for schools, that would make sense. I mean, the Congress included uh, more than $82 billion in funding in the end-of-year omnibus bill for, among other things, HVAC upgrades. So we're working on a webinar with PHCC and Hardy that's aimed at their members and how they can help schools with those upgrades. And yeah, I think one of the things we've been talking about on this show is the increased focus, I think, that we'll see on variable speed technology, but maybe in new construction, but also in retrofits and equipment that needs to be replaced. But I think variable speed technology can play a big role here when we talk about kind of mitigating the effects of the increased filtration, increased outdoor airflow on efficiency. Because if we have variable speed technology, we're not focusing on on off so much. We're not focusing on running that fan at 100% capacity 100% of the time. We can slow it down to match capacity as buildings raise and lower their occupancy in this kind of crazy work from home world. We can keep airflow going and not running the system at full speed. So I think variable speed has a big role to play kind of going forward. And maybe you're right in more in new construction, but certainly in retrofits too in the right scenario. Yeah, it's a good point to bring up. A Nate certified technician could probably answer better than I can. But I mean, in my own house, um, I have a variable speed heat pump that I have paired with a gas furnace. And every time I walk out, on the, the screen porch, it's right next to it, and it's running most of the time, often at low speed, but it's still running. So it's adding ventilation and removing humidity, particularly in the summer. But it's another technology that, that should be under serious consideration when equipment is up for replacement. Yeah, and I think that brings us to another topic is what are you seeing as kind of the new technologies that can be developed to help building owners adapt to this kind of post-pandemic world as they kind of navigate it? Our member companies are constantly looking at ways to innovate and meet the needs of the marketplace. But and we have member companies that have, for example, all-in-one systems that they use in modular school buildings uh, that provide ventilation, filtration, and humidity control all in one package unit. So it's just an easy thing to choose if it's a modular school building. We have other companies that have new systems that they brought online probably in record time to use in malls and hospitals that emphasize indoor air quality for those spaces where large groups of people gather and certainly in areas like hospitals that require certain levels of of health and safety. Certainly the UV light treatment folks are being looked at in a more urgent light as well. But I think if we continue to see an emphasis on IAQ, and I think we will, our members will continue to innovate. One of the things that we normally see at the uh, AHR Expo, which of course we didn't have this year, is uh, Innovation Awards. And you know, I, I know that Dan Foss uh, pretty much cleaned up last year from what I recall. Yep, we were very um, proud. <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> um, but the Innovation Awards, I think that in coming years, IAQ will probably have uh, more of an emphasis there. There's gonna be a lot of innovation. I mean, no industry survives standing still. And ours certainly is no exception to that rule. Yeah. And I I think that there is a lot of technology available today that can really do a lot. But like we were talking about before, I think the distinction is going to be, okay, a new construction where you can start from scratch. Yeah. A new building can be really good in terms of indoor air quality and efficiency. But what are we going to do with the existing building stock and these buildings that are already around the schools that kids need to occupy, the offices that are not going anywhere. I think that's going to be the real challenge. And this is not a new challenge. This is a challenge that's existed for efficiency, for renewables, for anything. But I think IAQ just adds another layer to that challenge. Yeah. We talked about some of the recommendations that we put out there, and certainly they're being taken seriously by building owners you know, who are trying to make their spaces safer for when occupants return. And it's really a demand thing. I mean, I think that 
building tenants are asking tough questions about what are you doing to keep us safe for the money that we spend? And it's a fair question. And you know, I mean, the same is true for schools and parents and teachers and administrators are demanding this type of thing too. And, you know, fortunately for them, I mean, they, I mentioned earlier that they got funding and there was 82 million in funding in the omnibus bill. So that type of uh, extra funding can go a long way. And that's why, you know, we want to educate the contractors and the distributors particularly on ways they can best help these folks accomplish their IAQ goals. And yeah, I think another interesting aspect to it is some of these building emissions laws that we've seen in places like New York and Washington and these um, decarbonization laws that we're seeing in California and some other places, how is that going to mesh with these new requirements for IAQ and what does that look like? So I think just kind of the dual challenges of the pandemic and climate change and some of the policy goals that legislators and policymakers have could clash, but I think it'll be interesting to see how that comes together. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, if you're going to compete, if you will, energy efficiency and safety, safety is always going to win. So I think it's really trying to strike the right balance and also provide incentives for building owners to replace their equipment. And I think we saw that in the uh, omnibus bill as well. The tax credit, uh, I think it's 179D, I want to say, got a permanent extension. So that goes a long way toward providing incentives for people to replace their equipment. And, you know, we talked earlier about the um, multi-speed and that type of thing. If you can replace equipment with that type of equipment, you're going to go a long way toward keeping people safe and saving energy at the same time. So it's a win-win, but it's not a quick process, but every incentive helps. Yeah. And I think you're right. It's not just about technology or education. It's about business models and incentives and policy also. It's going to take all of it to really make this happen. So this has been a great discussion. To wrap up, I kind of want to ask you, how do you see indoor air quality five years from now? Is this still going to be a topic that we're discussing? Is it still going to be front and center in people's minds? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I wonder if it will hang on as a priority once the pandemic is passed. I mean, I think that we tend to believe that these things will continue on their merry way. I suspect it will. And I think one of the things that would be looked at as new buildings get designed is how to allow occupants to bring in outside air on their own, uh, whether it's through vents or opening windows. And if you're talking about filtration, maybe Uh, continued emphasis on increased filtration can help slow the spread of all infectious diseases and, you know, help reduce employee sick time and reduce healthcare costs. So, I mean, if you look at it that way, you could definitely make the case for it continuing. You know, uh, one of the things that I noticed, and this isn't about HVAC, is that the cases of the flu this year are virtually nil. I mean, part of the reason for that is is everybody's running around in a mask, right? Or everybody's being careful and washing their hands and things that we ordinarily ought to do every winter. Maybe not the mask part, but certainly the hand washing part. And I think it's sort of changing people's habits. And this is really what we're talking about here is changing people, the way people look at the importance of, of HVAC systems and their role in keeping people healthy and safe. Yeah, I think that's so true. I was, in fact, just talking about that topic with my wife about, you know, how neither of us have really been sick this year. And it's really a corollary effect to to what we're seeing with the pandemic. So, but some really interesting stuff here, Francis, I really appreciate you joining us. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Envisioneering Exchange. Again, I'd like to thank my guest, Francis Dietz, VP of Public Affairs at AHRI. And don't forget to subscribe to Envisioneering Exchange on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever it is you listen to your podcast. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to rate, review, and share with your network. It really helps us out. My name is John Sheff, Director of Public and Industry Affairs at Danfoss, and thanks for listening. Talk to you next time. This podcast is for information purposes only. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Envisioneering Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and not necessarily represent those of Danfoss LLC and its employees. Danfoss LLC is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. This podcast series does not constitute professional advice or services. This podcast, including Danfoss LLC and the producers, disclaim responsibility from any possible adverse effects of information contained herein. 
opinions of guests are their own, and Dan Foss LLC in this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility of statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about the guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of the Envisioneering Exchange podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website, computer, or playing device.